is presented by Hawaii Contemporary and Hi Sam. Um, this series is a continuation of a conversation sparked by uh, the Hawaii Triennial 2022, uh, Pacific Century, Eho'omao no Moana Nui Akea, uh, curated by Melissa Chu, Miwako Tezuka, and Drew Kahuaina Broderick. Um, while the Triennial closed actually back in May, um, I wanted to remind everyone, uh, virtually and in person, that um, the exhibition here at Hai Sam um, will be open until the beginning of December. Um, and it also includes new work um, by Ed Grevy and Haunani K. Trask, which was originally at the Honolulu Museum of Art, but is presented here in the gallery that we're in. Um, so uh, before I introduce the sisters, um, I would like to also mahalo our sponsors and our uh, community partners um, through which the triennial would not be possible. So, Mahalo again to Hai Sam, to Engaging the Census Foundation, to Creative New Zealand, Bishop Museum, the East West Center, Hawaiian Airlines, and of course, Olelo Community Media, who is helping us to support our, um, our live stream today. So shout out to everyone who's joining us um, from Aotearoa and across the Moana. So mahalo. Um, so today we are joined by the Pacific Sisters, a fluid collective of Maori, Tongan, Samoan, and Cook Island women, solas, and fa'afifine artists, designers, storytellers, performers, musicians, educators, and mentors. Initiated in the early 1990s at warehouse spaces, um, and the streets of Tamaki Makoto, Auckland, by Selena Forsyth, Suzanne Tamaki, and Nephi Tupaya, the group came together around their shared love for fashion, activism, and collaboration. For nearly three decades, the Pacific Sisters have been in constant and active reformation and ever, an ever-evolving cast of family and friends. Um, for the Hawaii Triennial 2022, um, the participating sisters include Rosanna Raymond, Emma Lyon, Annie O'Neill, Fiona Clifton, Salvador Brown, Ruth Woodbury, Nephi Tupaya, Suzanne Tamaki, and Millie Tamaki. Um, and their project, Te Pu e Te Feke, was presented at Bishop Museum. So today we have joining us um, Rosanna Raymond, Suzanne Tamaki, and Fiona Clifton. So mahalo for joining us. Please join me in welcoming the Petitions Sisters. So, you know, in our conversations over the last few days, I kind of quickly realized that the Pacific Sisters kind of encompasses so much more than just an art collective. It's really about sisterhood, about family, and about connecting with one another, um, with genealogy, with land, um, kind of spiritually, and through the act of making and creating together. Um, Rosanna, I think it was you who said that the Pacific Sisters um, created a safe space for you to be yourself. Um, so my question is, my first question is maybe you can each introduce yourselves and just kind of talk about what, what is it that you offer to the Pacific Sisters? What is, that you, what is your excellence and what do you bring? I cry the ocean. I bleed the earth, and I greet you with my dead. May our waters greet your waters. May our mountains mm. greet your mountains. May our people greet your people. And may I take a little shout out to the Pacific Sisters who can't be here with us. Emma Lyon, Ruth Woodbury, Annie O'Neill, Nephi Tupaya, and did I forget Salvador Brown? Salvador. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so they're probably sitting at home with FOMO. But, and um, may we take this time to acknowledge those who have passed, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we are indeed the past, the present, and the future. And of course, we've got to give thanks and praise to the uh, Hawaiian Triennale for uh, inviting us and hosting us. So, and for the journey that it 
that it was for us to actually get here. So I really, it's wonderful that that you know went the extra mile or kilometre where we're from to um, enable us to to sit to, together. So um, yeah, yeah. So I'm Rosanna. So I usually get made to do the speaking, <laughs> <laughs> even though I ask somebody else. You know, the oldest. And, and what do I bring as a Pacific sister to the party? Um, I bring, I bring the next generation through my son, and I'm trying to encourage my daughter, but we've got a bit of work to do there. <laughs> and I am. A lot of times, I've been the arms and legs over the years. So, so not just a lot of the sort of kind of not just in a, in, a, in a creative space, but also in a production space. And this year, well, last year we were lucky enough to bring on board Millie Tamaki to actually bring on some production value. That wasn't me. Otherwise, I look like a really mm. funny fecky. <laughs> sort of, yeah. So um, what else? Um, I'm a slow learner. So um, I've always got to shout out to the Pacific Sisters and their patience for being able to um, teach me. But I think also I bring the Puraco, I'm a, mytho a mythology freak. So um, I always like to reach down and, into the, the stories f of where we are, which reminds me sitting in this room, you know, I forgot to acknowledge the Kanaka Māori who hold the mana of the land that, that we're standing on, you know, which was taken from them. So, mm. so please excuse me for not acknowledging you as sort of kind of half invited guests to your to your to your islands. So yeah, so it's it's a journey and I'm you know and I'm like a long time love so I'm here for the whole journey and um, and I'll pass it on to my beautiful sister. <laughs> Kia ora ko Suzanne Tamaki Toku Ingawa. My name is Suzanne Tamaki. This is my sister Millie sitting over here who's also travelling with us. Um, and then I guess what I bring to the collective is I'm a maker, a fibre artist. I'm, I like to investigate using different materials and the effect of colonisation that it's had on Māori culture specifically and its people. And uh, initially I was the producer, so I produced our first fashion shows when we first started out. I'm so glad I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> I've also got a full-time job, so I work for Wellington City Council as a city arts and events producer, so I'm really busy during the day, so it's great to have Pacific Sisters as an outlet uh, for another way to show my work practice and also to have this group next to me, supporting me and also pushing me to try harder and go further. And I'm also really good at karaoke. Oh yeah. <laughs> so hit me up if you want to go out to karaoke later. <laughs> <laughs> Passing it over. Um, o lo ingoa o Fiona. Um, I was born and raised in Auckland, Aotearoa. Um, what I've done in the group has evolved over the years. Um, I came from a performing arts background, so piano, classical piano and um, performance. And when I met the sisters, I basically kind of started in production really and started, um, you know, helping with that side of things. And throughout the years, um, I've uh, that's evolved into um, basically, you know, um, all that stuff. All that stuff, yeah. Making costume, dance, music, uh, yeah, just being involved and and uh, always being inspired by the sisters and trying to learn uh, new techniques and things like that. So mahalo. I think when sometimes when we think about the collective, um, we also, you know, we think about how one's kind of individuality may kind of get lost. Um, but it seems that kind of each of your individual uh, individual individuality and individual offerings kind of come together to form and strengthen um, this this 
shared kaupapa, or this shared intention, or this shared purpose. Um, could you kind of share a little bit about that kind of kaupapa, which kind of under... Um, yeah. yeah. You know, actually, it's really an important um, context in terms of where we came out of in Aotearoa in the 1990s, because it was a particular time. And as a, as a, a, a group of women, especially, as when I met um, Suzanne, we were both, both young mothers, so we were sort of, as individuals, we were not, not fate, fate, it was hard. You were struggling. We were struggling. We, we, we didn't see things that reflected our own selves. We were mothers. We also had to pay rent and, you know, little things like that. And, and it was actually as a collective that we, we enabled each other to take on jobs. Mm. We um, shared knowledge and shared skills um, with each other. And as the Pacific Sisters grew, I used to get a lot of things like, oh, you're all that strong woman. How do you, like, you know, handle it? And I, but I always, for me, I, uh, one of my mentors had always said, you know, you cannot have a strong collective without a strong group of individuals. Mm. And, and they always sat, sat within me because it, it's... And also, I think, just being Polynesian, just by the very nature of our being, we are collective people. There, you know, there is no I, there is we. But when we get educated through the state system, especially within the arts, mm. it, it, which the three of us sitting here haven't had a formal art education inside those things. But I think that was, in a way, used to our advantage because we weren't sort of educated to be individuals. You, you we were educated by our people and our communities to be people that, that cared about each other, mm -hmm. that loved each other and nurtured each other. And we, and we were um, forced to do our own research as well to find our own stories because we didn't grow up being told them. So Rosanna, even though she said she's a slow learner, she's not, that's a lie. Um, she's a prolific reader and did loads of research when we were first starting out and she came in with quite a lot of Samoan knowledge and I had some Māori knowledge and we started going to Wānanga, learning how to um, do traditional making as well as bringing in our own skills that we already had which are probably more contemporary and then figuring out how to blend those two together. Um, and probably one of the biggest advantages when I first met Rosanna um, as a mum, both being mums with young children, was being able to share the responsibility of our children. I think as women, we cared about all our kids, not just one. It was a, a group and all our kids grew up together. And the sisters all had to like change their nappies. Yeah. <laughs> and drop them off and pick them up and feed them. And it just was, uh, you didn't even have to ask. It just happened. It was like a natural thing. And so that nurturing extended beyond just our kids and to all of us as well and, and other people who started to come in to join our group. And um, people often ask, oh, you know, they sometimes trip up on our name, Pacific Sisters, and um, uh, perhaps think that it's a band of exclusivity. But throughout the whole time that I've that you know we've been involved with each other it's always been open to all peoples um, we started before the labels came um, so sometimes some of the younger people that come in um, are you know understandably questioning uh, what we stand for but we've always recognized that there's ver all the different groups the whawhawhine um, the people that are you know, trans, all of those people are within our communities and we need to embrace those. And also we've all, all ably been supported along the way by many men mm. <laughs> um, who really believe in that kaupapa. And some of the driving force behind when we met was really, I feel, uh, the ability to just recognise in each other that we are you know, we're the children and the grandchildren of the immigrants that came to New Zealand in the 60s. And we were trying, as New Zealanders growing up in, in an urban environment, trying to um, find our roots. We were the generation that was really searching uh, because those things had been suppressed 
on on our elders the language had been stopped and 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 the cultural things were seen a lot of it was seen as not worth doing um, not worth having in the big city and this is what you know when Rosanna's researching legends and and the mythologies and things like that and the stories um, the oral histories this is what we're trying to uncover underneath our work and this is what we put first in any new work, um, you know, and, it, and it's been there right from the beginning. And I think, um, you know, that's that's really the underlying kaupapa, kaupapa driven frock. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's those stories and those skills that are so similar across the Pacific that we all bring into it and that we share um, that has really helped us cement us as a group as well. So yeah, I mean, the Pacific Sisters is very much about a shared kind of mindset and, and understanding, and it, it is very fluid. Um, you guys have a kind of core membership of about eight to 12, um, and then literally hundreds of collaborators, um, depending on different projects and stuff. But um, you both kind of touched a little bit about it, but I'm wondering um, just a little bit more out of, of the um, kind of the cultural context through which Pacific Sisters emerged in the early 90s. So we're talking like you mentioned, you know, different waves of migration, um, also the Maori Renaissance, which is, just had happened a couple decades before. Um, so yeah, so what was what was it like politically and what was the art scene like? <sighs> <laughs> I think it was white, um, and we were really tired of seeing white faces on TV, on magazines, on the radio. We, we weren't particularly good at stuff on walls, mm. and and also because we hadn't come out of an artistic institution, so our networks were different. But thanks to Annie O'Neill and Lisa Rayhana, who I'm sure are names that you recognise, they sort of took us into a different realm. And I mean, at that time, Annie and Lisa were literally some of the first Pacific and Maori women to actually come out of an institution. Mm -hmm. So even that was in, in, incredible. In the, in the streets of Auckland, because this is where we, we all met, Tamaki Makoto, there was this, um, the, yeah, there'd been a hard slog of activism through the tangata whenua, through the Māori people, and that was starting to, you know, as they planted deep seeds, and these seeds were growing and they were blossoming, and, and we definitely were, you know, that this really enabled us, you know, they'd done a lot of the hard lifting, and so, so we do a lot of the, we had a more playful mm. um, ability to, to play because we didn't have to kind of, carry that load so hard. The Māori language was starting to come into the schools and and for us, especially us migrant children of, of Pacific Islanders, we still were caught in between the space because the with the Treaty of Waitangi that was between the, the, the Tangata Whenua and the Crown. And the Crown. And so that did not include Pacific Islanders, mm. and so there was a very fraught. There was a lot of fraught tension between between the role of our relationships, mm. our our ancient heritage and connections had been erased, and it was just Maori started to look at us like overstayers. And it was only through a lot of our elders and you know going, hey, where they walk, where's your walker from? You know, I often got, grew up getting told to go home, so I'd get this really little confused guy going, but... Yeah, so there was fraughtness, but within that, I always go, that's where all this, this lovely juice comes up. Then you, the music scene was coming up, the fashion scene was coming up. There was all these sort of, sort of... There was a whole new scene coming up. New Zealand music was mm. sort of started to be played on the radio. You know, we, we had to look for our histories because they weren't mm. put in the front, or in the behind, or in the middle of any sort of mainstream sort of anything. The only time you saw brown people was when they were in trouble, mm -hmm. when that was on Crime Watch, you know, on TV. Have you seen this guy? Oh, look, he's brown. <laughs> there, there was a lot of that. Mm. There was a lot of um, lower socio-economical. They're in the hospitals. They're, you know, they're, they're getting this. It's you know, which remains today. There, there's some aspects of what we were pushing against 
are still very much in the present. So, mm. so it was, and it was an exciting time. It was yeah. really exciting. Don't get us wrong. We got in a lot of trouble. Sort of, and and we were we weren't the kids that went to church, mm. or if they did go to church, it was after the clubs, <laughs> and a bit of a shower and a nice dress, and they were there. So they were having these really double double lives. Some mm. of our members, some of our members are the children of of activists from the Polynesian Panthers. Yeah. So so us all, and we came together in the clubs, in the streets, you know, through music, through gigs, through. You know, and it and it slowly, slowly spilled out, and into a, a more sort of formal art environment. But it took over a decade. Yeah, and and Rosanna touched on it briefly about how we sort of had a legacy of racism, but it wasn't just against colonists. It was also uh, Samoans against Maoris, Tongans against Samoans. Um, you know, my dad's generation. I remember. Calling bongers. That's right. Yeah. You <laughs> and, coconuts. And coconuts. We, we call ourselves coconuts and bongers. Though, yeah. So, yeah. It's well, okay. we do. We're empowering it. Yeah. yeah. And my, horries. My, my, my Samoan grandmother, don't you go hang out with those my own. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a thing we inherited. It was like you don't mix with those people. So when we started this group, the people couldn't understand why we had got together, why we were all hanging out yeah, together. Really... It was and great. It was, yeah, and I think what Fiona was talking about too in terms of our culture, a lot of times our culture was only seen at festivals. So, you know, you get to put the costume on. So a costume. And then you did a performance. You know, anthropologists and you know, it becomes the performance of culture. And then I noticed it would get packed up and put away in a precious place until it was brought out for the next festival. And, and as our skill bases, we were sort of making and recreating and reworking and upcycling a lot of our cultural heritage skills. But we were wearing them to the clubs. We were wearing them down the streets. We were um, swapping with each other and, and making jewelry. So we, we were really trying to find this space for it every day. Mm. And you know, there was, in, in terms of in the 90s in particular, the visibility of uh, Māori and Pacific media, you know, um, it took until the 2000s, until there was a Māori TV, you know, which it, the elders had been actually working, people had been working towards that goal for 30 years. Um, there was one Pacific Island, uh, you know, TV show, this is before internet, and that was Tangata Pacifica, mm -hmm. and they were... Very early in the morning. An anchor. You know, it was always on a Sunday morning. <laughs> um, it was always when no one watched, except us, because we always loved watching it. Um, and it was also a time when uh, there was a great occasion where, um, is it Dame Hinawehe Mohi? Yes, she actually, Same. at the time, she she caused an uproar in mainstream New Zealand by singing the yeah. national anthem in Māori at, the rugby. at a rugby game. Which she was wearing one of my necklaces. <laughs> and go. no one knew what she was going to do, and to her it was just a natural thing. And she sang that anthem in Māori, and it was just like a light bulb went on and fire ripped through the whole nation. And mm. now what's happening now is every single school in New Zealand learns their national anthem mm. in Māori. And, you know, it's these sort of small things that have contributed to, obviously, where New Zealand is heading. But when we were just starting out, the idea of New Zealand even being a nation in the Pacific was, you know, it was all about going back to Mother England and, uh, you know, acknowledging that side of the nation, but not the indigenous side. And so throughout our shows, what you know, the platform that we were trying to create in fashion, music, uh, performance, visual, visuals, it had to be end to end from Aotearoa or we were, from yeah. the Pacific. We were local. That's what we, that's our hardcore kaupapa, you know. Um, and, and because we knew that the talent was there, the models were there. If we went to other countries, we tried to use the locals there as well. 
So that's a big part of us. Yeah, so I mean, like the diversity of identities within the Pacific Sisters, Maori, Pacifica, Pakeha. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking about the kind of your, your work in institutions and how perhaps, you know, these mixed identities could be kind of problematic or challenging, um, where you don't neatly fit into Maori art, you don't fit into necessarily, I don't know, any kind of, you know, museological taxonomy and how this even um, may pose a problem for these festivals. Um, <laughs> Well, that's <laughs> yeah, I mean, how long have you got? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, we, I think initially, definitely, in terms of even funding, mm -hmm. in terms of we have Creative New Zealand, which, which, thank you, <laughs> which now, <laughs> I'll talk to you guys later about the first <laughs> 10, 20 years. I mean, we were kicked around like footballs. Oh no, it's Ma you have Māori in your group, mm -hmm. you need to go to the Māori department. The Māori department goes, oh no, you've got Pacific Islands in your group, you need to go to, to that department. And, and very, very slowly, and this took decades, I'd say about two, that they finally started to look at the collective as an entity mm -hmm. and started to, to fund, um, to help enable to fund us more but in a in a way we one of our sayings you know we never let money be a reason why we didn't do something mm. if we wanted to do something we we made jewelry we mm. fundraised we had raffles we really what well, that is that do-it-yourself ethic and it really i think has sort of it sort of it made us tired because i tell you you know i'm sure there's a lot of old soldiers out there that have been working hard trying to keep themselves going when they're not funded, when you can't. So it, it was, I'd say, after 10 years, we were tired. We mm -hmm. were really tired because we were just constantly, constantly put, you know, we were inventing new terms for even, for what we were. Back, back then, uh, uh, the term New Zealand-born Pacific Island didn't even exist. Mm -hmm. Pacifica wasn't, wasn't, wasn't used either, mm -hmm. and, and so, so there was all this sort of, and institutionally is interesting, and I think you just have to sort of kind of see that it took over 30 years for the Pacific Sisters to enter a, a, a mainstream institution. I think that says a lot, just in itself, that it took 30 years for us to be acknowledged as artists. We weren't even at artists because we're like crafty women you know because that's what women do when they get together and they, you know but it, and it also opened the doors for other groups um to yeah. follow because they're now creative Re yeah. new zealand recognizes that yeah. aotearoa recognizes that and i think that for other indigenous nations they can see that and use it as a model as well and support yeah. that and just you're talking about working in institutions what i do have to say about that especially now um, at my age, that I can make more change on the inside than yep. I can on the outside, and that's where we can start to write those policies and write those strategies and get more Māori and PI involved in what it is that we're doing on the streets and pay them good money as well. Yeah, I think um, that's the evolving role of Tuakana Taina too. Yeah. As, as the younger generation, you know, it's they're strong enough to hold that space. We don't have to hold that space anymore. But you know we can use a lot of skills that we've we've sort of evolved with and put them into sort of challenging and working within those particular structures mm. that 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 work in particular ways. Mm. I think we talked about it the other day that within the institutions, you know, we even though we may not agree with everything that's going on in them, um, it is actually it's up to us to. Uh, it, it's a place of negotiation where, when we enter into that space. And so we just need to be assured in our approach, understand what we would like to achieve, and then see if we can achieve that. Yeah, and, and then, looking at the limits too, you know, yeah. looking at it's not, and we don't come from a place of deficit. And I think that's one thing that I've always really, really enjoyed about Pacific Sisters. We, you know, we, we, we've never, we, we've really tried in, in terms of enhancing our own mana. We knew that, that that would come through being positive, being creative and working with love. 
Mm. And I said this the other night, if you take the art away, what do we have? And mm. for, you know, and I think even for a lot of artists, you take, take the art away, what have they got? And that, I, I'm not judging, but I'm judging. <laughs> And, and, and I, you know, I really, I think for the Pacific, <laughs> with the Pacific sisters, you know, if we, it's, it hasn't been easy. We've lost some, we've won some, you know, we fight, we really are like sisters. It's, you know, but it's the love, it's the aroha, it's the aloha mm. that, the, that, that has, I think, enabled us to, to work together for over three decades. <laughs> And it's, I think, a very magic ingredient mm -hmm. that you can't put money on. How do you monetize that? Mm -hmm. Which has been hard because we do, yeah, I do like paying my rent too. So, and, you know, in terms of where are we now in Aotearoa, in institution wise, we, Nina Tonga was the curator for our retrospective exhibition, which was in 2018, 2019, which we didn't feel old enough to to be part of but anyway um not dead. no and she was actually the new zealand's very first pacific curator at that level mm. uh you know for the museum of new zealand so you know that was very fortunate for us and and a big shout out to nina and Ooh. and just mm. and sometimes people you know when we first met her we we were sort of a bit because she's a lot younger than us, and we thought, well, how, how did you actually know about us? Because, you know, really, we were on the fringes, and there wasn't much written about us. And she just said, look, I actually came to your shows as a teenager. And so that's when we understood um, that, you know, um, our thing was becoming a generational thing. And, uh, you know, when we, we have some work in the Auckland Museum, that's, you know, you can look that up online. Um, and just negotiating contracts and terminology. Terminology, Rosanna has a, has a uh, you know, a talked a lot about this in her academic work. Uh, but, you know, it, it actually came down to some labelling issues about, um, you know, we can get very detailed sometimes, but sometimes the detail does matter. And to us, our things are not objects in a contract. Our things are mea sina, taonga. You know, they're our treasure. our treasure. And we don't view them as static. We view them as living objects. And into our contracts, we actually wrote that if it is not us that put those, those mea sina in there, it will be our descendants that you will be able to call upon to come and be with them, spend some time, look after them, you know, repair anything that needs doing, because we will make sure of that, and that's how we want it to be within. And so it is about that relationship, and, and we were talking about this the other night, the relationship between ourselves, our communities, the institutions. Yeah. Mm. daydreaming about that. Um, maybe, maybe now's a good time to just talk about um, Te Puo Te Feke, the project that was initiated at Bishop Museum. Um, the name, which translates to the head or the brain of the octopus, um, it's, it's kind of a metaphor for kind of the way you work. I mean, each, I learned that um, the octopus has what, eight brains? or something Nine. like that. Nine? Nine. Um, and and the, each brain kind of controls an arm. Um, but the central brain yeah. has got the overview. The overview. Yeah, so, the, yes. The yeah, so, you know, actually maybe this is the way to, so with eight to 12 and potentially hundreds of collaborators, how do decisions actually get made? <laughs> like a straw. <laughs> well, a lot of times if, like, if a project comes in, well, sort of, we have a few base kind of rules, loose rules. One is if, if there's less than three, it's not a Pacific Sisters gig, then you might as, you know, do, do it individually. So that, that's one base. And the, the other one is who's available? Mm. Oh my God. 
<laughs> we, yeah. we were lucky for, for the project at Te Papa that, that there was 12 available. And, um, you know, and that's why it's important for us to acknowledge those ones that are there. And there usually is sort of, it seems to be a, a sort of solid dozen. And then budget. Mm. To budgets are a big, you know, your constraints or, you know, your piece, I call it your piece of string. We always go, well, how long is your piece of string? <laughs> because that, that will enable the Pacific Sisters to make decisions if they are able to contribute, if they have enough time, if they can take the time off work, you know. And so. we can say no now. We don't have to say yes to everything yeah. anymore. Which is great, so we can choose what it is that we want to do. And yeah. like Rosanna said, if people are available, then we'll do it. And if we feel really strongly about it, yeah. we'll do it. But we get quite a lot of offers now. So um, we can be kind of choosy about what it is and who who wants to be involved. Yeah, too. some projects, sort of, Suzanne and I did sort of a little project with um, the Canadians. Yeah, that Toronto. We're, we're just, Annie O'Neill's about online. to take over and do um, a one for Scape with the Pacific Sisters. Some of the Annie and Fiona worked on the Auckland Museum one because, you know, we're busy. So it really is our, like, you know, who wants to play? <laughs> but also, um, you know, we do, when, when the project is underway, um, there's a process where we come together in Wananga and workshop. And um, usually we, we ask, every, everyone is asked to bring Bring it. Bring something. Bring what they bring. What they know. Bring what they have to the one that they want to experiment with or work on. They know the framework already, and then for two to three days we go into intensive session. And by the time we come out of it, we've got an activation or you know um, some form of thing that we've wanted to achieve and. And that's really a must. So Te Pū or Te Whiki was one of the, f you know, that was our actually our first project that came about through having to work through a digital medium because of COVID. Because not only were we isolated, we're actually, for many years we've been scattered around New Zealand and also overseas. But here was a problem where we actually couldn't physically be in the same space together to Wānanga. And so we had to actually um, pivot that project at least three times um, in order to work out how to do it. And we ended up asking Patti Tyrell, who's our wonderful photographer that we collaborated with on the project, to meet with each sister. And uh, he, did, he did most of the portraits. Um, Rosanna's brother, Ulrich, and Vivian Haldane were, was the other photographer that, that stood in to uh, take the photo, but the, the actual photos had to be ta all got taken in different places, and so that was a, a wonderful thing. And then, yeah, well, yeah. there's, I mean, there is a lot of work. Once we've, we've gathered, we set the kaupapa. All right, what, where, when, how? Mm. So once we develop those, then, you know, what, how are we going to get the money? So where are we going to go get the money? Because, and so we developed the, through the ideas, then we developed the budgets, and, and now we're starting to work with the larger budgets, where it's really important to bring on somebody like Millie, who can actually make sure that we are crossing the T's and dotting the I's for Creative New Zealand. We're having to write reports. Yes, we did the thing, we did it really, yeah. We did the thing, we, you know, and this is what it looked like. So as we've developed, we've had to increase our professional sort of, sort of levels mm. of, of working with, with institutions mm. with, with, and being, you know, responsible with, with, with money. And then, so, you know, the, so from, you know, I call this the spectacle. And this is, you know, the front of house spectacle. And, and a lot of you will get to experience that spectacle. But at the back of the house, there's, you know, the arms and legs are preparing the food, washing the dishes, making sure the guests are all looked after. So, so you know, and, and that's where the, the collective for me is, is so much more than just the collective. Dur during we, one of our Pacific sisters, Annie O'Neill, lost her husband two years ago. 
And that's for me when I saw the, the Pacific Sisters' greatest artwork in terms of everybody dropped everything and we came and we looked after her and we cried together. We, you know, and we still look after her because, you know, that, as I said, it's, it's about love. And, and, and for me, this love comes through these, I mean, I've developed this concept called the new Aitu, which, which the Aitu in Samoa, a lot of people think it's kind of the scary oogie boogie guy that kind of scares you at night, don't look in the mirror. But the Aitu is also that really cheeky essence of a person mm. that, that, that has this freedom to roam even when maybe to leave your physical body. In, in the present, and and so, and for me, it's like, like, and a lot of us have avatars now. We're really developing sort of like uh, my one Puna Toto. She's actually full tusk made in the, the third. Mm. So so, and and actually, the love that we have for each other is the love that we put into developing our new I too. That's why I go costuming. Do not call it a costume, and I am not here to perform for you. <laughs> Um, you know, basically, through our bodies, we will share the stories of our love for our culture and each other. Mm. And, and that's one of the most sort of, that keeps me coming back. <laughs> I think, and one of the other things um, Creative New Zealand wanted to know is if COVID hit, how were we going to be able to share oh our stories, gosh, what we're we going to be able to do, and so... Um, yeah, we, we thought we might not make it. We were in a serious lockdown. So, and, and this is where our techie fecky here. So since 2018, I'd been working with a Wellington company called Indigi NZ Alpha State uh, using augmented reality. So initially I had worked with uh, Te Papa Tongarewa Museum of New Zealand, and we um, did some 3D photogrammetry images of some of the Māori collection items. And the exhibition that I had, I had artwork on the walls and every single artwork had an associated taonga from the museum. And what that showed is that you could take museum pieces out of a museum, put them into another space anywhere in the world, and you didn't have to worry about um, how it was installed, what the conditions are, because it's augmented, so it's not real. And if you don't know what augmented reality is, it's when an image and sound is superimposed on top of another image. So did anyone come to the, our exhibition? Do you want to put your hand up? Oh, thank you for coming. <laughs> so sorry we weren't there. Um, did you download the app at all? Did you know there was an app? You downloaded it. Did you know there was an app? Did you download it? So if you, go, if you want to do it now, have any, has anyone got smartphones? You got your phones on you? Have you got data? You got Wi-Fi? <laughs> So go into, your, um, go into your Google Store or your App Store, Play Store, and Google Pacific Sisters, just one word, and you'll see that we've got the app in there. It'll come up and it looks like your badge. you want to show your badge? Yes. <laughs> Which is the coconut. Yep, the face of the eel. So that'll come up and you'll see, once it's um, downloaded, it might take a little bit, but do please go on and have a look. Yep, that's it, you've got it. Nice work, you were quick. <laughs> you get a you get a prize. Come and see me later. <laughs> Show the back of the room. <laughs> Kapoi. Yeah. And so on the um, front page, you've got all of the sisters on there. So if you want to read our bios and also to read more about the work, it talks about the photographs, uh, the meaning behind them, and also yeah, what what they're made of. Yep. Materials. Yeah. So it's quite in depth. Yeah. Speaking of like institutional, it's like no, we just. We want a tombstone. They just want the name, <laughs> what it's made out of, and the year you were born. <laughs> and we're like, but. <laughs> how this is so long. Everything's got a name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So this is how we managed to get yeah. the information we wanted to share, is that we just did it ourselves. So it's basically our online catalogue. And then if you go to the second page, which is the AR, you'll see on the bottom, just there, there's a little box, and if you push it, um, and then look on, look on the floor and a circle pops up and you hit the circle. Don't play up now. Of course it will. And then what will happen is, um, it'll let me down. 
Anyway, once you do that, I can talk to you, I'll show you later if you really want to see it. And what will happen is it shows you the gallery, what, exactly how it was placed in Hawaii. So you'll see all, you'll see this on your phone. And what you can do is go in closer towards one of the portraits and it will give you the AR experience. And all of the AR has sound featured with it. And the idea was, well, that's what I was hoping, that there'd be lots of people there with their devices with the sound on, and then you'd start to hear all these sounds and voices and singing from people's phones. And so you'd have this interactive experience while you're looking at all our portraits, so they'd all be singing to each other. So, yay! <laughs> so there you go. Yeah, so it was a really, I mean, Suzanne, through her own individual mahi, shared with all of us as a, as a collective. And I think, again, that shows that as we all learn new skills, we all feed them in into the, into the collective, which, you know, is, is a very generous off, offering. You know, a lot of artists are like, no, I invented this, this is mine. You know, you can't do that because I did it, like, you know, five years ago. <laughs> you know, and so, so we're, we're very much sort of trying not to be those guys. <laughs> Sorry, ladies. <laughs> Thank you. Um, people. People. Um, I'm a lady. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I think just, you know, a personal reflection for me, I think just kind of like standing, you know, in the center of these images, I just kind of felt this just sense of safety and the sense of like protection. Um, you know, these, these um, images um, of ladies in of women, of sisters in um, these kind of warrior-like poses, like, you know, nothing felt kind of adversarial about that to me. It felt like Good. I was in this, yeah, this zone of protect protection, this malu of protection. Um, and it really also kind of helped, you know, me kind of reflect on the own, you know, on mana wahine and the own kind of strong women in my life um, who have always been around me, <laughs> <laughs> even to this day. Um, yeah, and, and to reflect on and those in the past, those with me now, and those those to come in the future. I wonder if you have any kind of thoughts on on mana atua and, and within mana wahine as a country. Well, we're, I did challenge the sisters because, I mean, it would have been really easy for us to design some beautiful costumes and put them on a beautiful little thing that's really easy to stare at. That's, you know, easy. But I, and also because we knew there was the potential for us not to be here physically, to, for you to enjoy and bask in the <laughs> company of the Pacific Sisters. So it was, I really challenged us to, to, to do a series of portraits of us, mm. you know, to reflect the diversity of, of mana wahine. And as you can see, there, you know, there's many forms of Wahine, and we're talking about it in the most broadest sense. And so it's not gender based. So, and, and I felt it was, because you have to be brave, and not all of us, you know, we each have different skills. Some are performers. You can, you, can, you know, I use my body, it's one of my prime materials. And, and so, you know, I'm, put the, not everybody in the collective is comfortable with that. So some of our sisters went way outside their comfort zones. Just having a portrait, you know, it was a real act of bravery. And, and again, I think just by being in the collective, we'll be able to, to support each other, to, to feel safe in that space, to, to be that that beautiful new I too to to really stand there and and especially too when we know that we weren't going to be here and like how would people mm. how would people react to to this you know and you know or was it okay and and then trying to ensure too that that you know we're not just honouring our our cultural heritage and all and all the stories the puraka that that we wanted to tell but. You know that that we were coming into Kanaka Maori land as well. It wasn't this is not our whenua. Mm. This is not our land. So we were hoping, 
And I think that's the beauty of the AR. It was able to provide these different layers that sometimes you can miss if you just look at the spectacle. I mean, mm. it's a great spectacle, I must say. <laughs> but, and, um, but yeah, if you do go into the app and you read, every sister's got beautiful, beautiful words to, to offer you to, to share with you their, their story that they, they wanted to bring to bring to you. So yeah, no, it's a, it was to get the feedback was is so mm. so mm -hmm. valuable because yeah, sometimes you do feel like you're working in, in an island and, and it, you know, of course what's completely normal to us <laughs> may not be so normal to other people <laughs> as I have found out over the years. Like, what do you mean? And I, one of the things that I love lots of things about it, but one of them is what Roseanne is alluding to is that this is us 30 years on. Mm. This is the stage where we've got to now. This mm. is how we're feeling about ourselves, our mm. own bodies, what's um, inspiring us or affecting us, where we are in our different spaces, and, and also working in sort of that COVID environment. It, was, it felt a little bit more singular again. We, we were working in our own little bubbles mm. or might just have one little mate helping us, which also made it a little bit uh, weird. Mm -hmm. But it was really nice to see them all come together and talking to each other and sharing the images as we did them so that we all felt a bit more cohesive around it as well. Yeah, and I just wanted to add, um, yeah, I just really enjoyed seeing the diversity and seeing the form of us telling our own stories having an Aitu, mm. um, you know, this was normal, like, for example, in Samoa, every day, ev uh, in many situations, um, you know, there's not gods that they used to pray to, it's every day Aitu that uh, yes. surround and, and us, that, that uh, you know, that have meaning. Um, this is why, you know, there's naming of mountains and, and uh, naming of many different winds and naming of many different aspects of nature. And yeah, I, I, I really enjoy that. I feel that Pacific Sisters is tr really trying to bring that kaupapa into he, where we are, as you mm. said, Suzanne, mm. here and now, and also how our everyday lives ha are impacting on that situation. And I uh, just want to say a little shout out to Salvador. Yeah. Um, he worked with all of us individually on our soundscapes, and we think that he's done an incredible job. So, Fafatili Lava, Sal. If you don't know, Salvador is Rosanna's son. And oh. he's the <laughs> shark. He's still got paid. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, seven. <laughs> Number seven. Work hard though with his aunties. <laughs> but yeah, he's he's doing amazing in the world of Taonga mm. Um So uh, we really value his input and help with what he he does for us. I also wanted to add another thing about our growth. Um, so what happened is both Rosanna, myself, and Nephi, who's in the orange. We all went back to school, so Rosanna and I went back to university and I got a Masters of Fine Arts, and what did you get? A Masters of Philosophy. And we got A pluses. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just add that in as well. Actually, I'm gonna thank a man sitting here in the room, actually. Well, Sony here at Nico, because you've been a big part of my journey for that. And I'd just like to thank you right here and now. Oh, beautiful. And Nephi's still studying. I think she's got two more years to go, but she's loving it. And what that did for me, and for you too, I'm sure, Rosanna, um, was it made me really look at my work and critique it yep. and figure out what it is I'm doing, why I'm doing it, and where it's come from, and then having to write about it as well. It's, um, I really enjoyed it. I loved being back studying again. I wish I could do more, yep. but it's hard to study and work at the same time. But I'm so proud that we did it. We're officially indigenous. We've got a paper now. <laughs> uh -oh. Well, it's been beautiful to kind of reflect on the last 30 years and to take a pause in the presence of, in this um, image here. And I love that Salvador is, is um, a part of the sisters. Um, it makes me think of, you know, genealogy, inheritance, 
continuity mm -hmm. and kind of what is next for the sisters. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, I even wonder as, as the Pacific sisters being like the shared mindset, like could the Pacific sisters outlive the sisters? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose now that our, our, our works are actually, have been collected by, you know, the museums, that, for me that is their, their role, mm. is, is to sort of, and a lot of times too, sort of, I always go, it's not very often we'll sell something brand new. They have to live with us and live lives and, and have things so that they really have got the Modi, you know, so that, the, and the Modi is, you know, in Māori and sort of a little bit different, but same in Samoa, Māori, Māori, that, um, what is it? In, Māori. Yeah, in, in Hawaiian, this kind of, the spark of life, this mm. essence, this life force. And for me, when they go into the institution, this is, this is where they, they become dormant, or for me, so I started to look at the museums like a, a resting place, a place that will look after them, but with a, with a few more sort of, um, in terms of my, my thesis is about putting the VAR and conservation on, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, we, we need to be looking at how we conserve the relationships just as much as the physical objet. Because if you're only looking after the physical object, then you're really helping, you know, to keep it through the lens of the past. And if we start to, to look at how we conserve relationships, we can start to look at how the past, the present, and the future of these beautiful mm -hmm. treasures that, that do lay inside the museums, how they can sort of be maintained and sustained. <coughs> and, and for me, this is a great way for museums to really themselves look at how they are mm. in, in the future. Yeah, and we do do it through our sons. Suzanne's son, <coughs> Rameka and Salvador are about to work on a big project with their auntie in Sydney later, later mm. this year. And Fiona's children are slowly starting to kind of, sort of, kind of go, oh, you guys, actually, you guys are kind of pretty cool, aren't you? But they're, they're sporty spices. Mm. They put all their beautiful creative energy into the water. They're all water people. So each, each of our children have a really, I think, been enhanced by, by the work that we've done as, as a collective. Mm, and inspired. But also, um, I feel like, to answer your question, Josh, I feel like I'm hoping that our kaupapa will have longevity. And um, the work in the Auckland Museum actually touches on uh, three of the songs that we felt as a collective that underlined the kaupapa that we'd been working with for many, many years. And they're songs by Henry Afu Taripo and his uncle Rutera Taripo. And, um, you know, one of them is Muriro, which is on display right now, but it's based about environmental activism. The next one is, which will be on display in a couple of years, is Super Summer, which talks about being the best individual, best that you, ancestor, best ancestor that you can be, and the third one, Tohu Tupuna, is a genderless deity that that encourages uh, cultural knowledge. Yeah, body sovereignty. You know, and we, body sovereignty. We to, to, you know, look so like I think body, mind, and souls. Yeah. yeah. So I would hope that our longevity is spoken through the work and if in the future when we pass and our our mokopuna you know mokopuna or friends of mokopuna want to take on that kopapa that's what i would hope for the future that that kopapa uh, is is there it's there for them mm. that's why we're doing it mm. Mahalo nui. Um, I would love to now just open up um, some space for some questions um, from the audience, if anybody has any questions. Yeah.
the women are coming off as warriors. And when you speak about, um, it's, it's like it has the feminine and the masculine energy. The strength is the masculine, and then the feminine energy of being tender, and all those things that you described when you were starting, and your motherhood, and everything, and being indigenous. I'm thinking that the world, because I'm from the white, I left the white for almost the same amount of time. COVID trapped me here. Uh. I became a snowbird. COVID trapped me here, which is <laughs> 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 Well, thank you, Mahalo. Thank you for your, um, you know, uh, statement. Um, I would just like to put it back to everyone, actually, in the room, and just um, I was just talking the other day about uh, the, the woman in New Zealand that gave our women that was the first in the world the vote uh, was Kate Edgar. And I'm paraphrasing, I will have to look it up because I keep saying I'm paraphrasing. But um, she talked about how if you realize that the rain, you know, don't give up hope in what you are doing yourself because like the rain, it's made up of single drops and that produces the rain. So together, if we each do our own thing, if we each take responsibility for how we are in the world and what we are doing and we transfer that to the people closest to us, then that is the only solution I, mm. I can see. You know, we're all responsible equally. And rather than looking to, you know, um, the government and, and other people, the outside, other, we, we need to go back to the source. And I, I really feel that, yeah. Was it Kate Shepherd or Kate Edgar? Kate Edgar. Edgar? Was it? It was Kate Shepherd. Kate Shepherd. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, it's all right. <laughs> but, um, and also for us, to be honest, our focus has always been Aotearoa. We've got issues there that we still that are ongoing that we are trying to address. And that, like I said, we can make more change on the inside. So if we can be an inspiration for women all around the world, that they need to take those positions, and they need to stand in those spaces, and they need to make that change. They need to drive it. You be the hero. Mahalo. We have, an, we have one more question.
Wow. Well, I suppose one of the foundations was making sure that we were grounded with our cultural heritage, that, 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 that really without that grounding, I could not produce or think or do the things I do. And, and yeah, so really, I always am so grateful to, you know, my Samoan grandmother, who always had busy hands, and my Pākehā side too. So I was always surrounded by women with busy hands, busy, yeah, in the garden, making things. And then my Pacific sister, my very patient Pacific sisters who taught this left-handed person a few more. So, so that journey to, to be able to reconnect with it, to be allowed to, you know, because that was, that was definitely sort of one of the first sort of absences was through getting an education mm. in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And so that was, so, and then, you know, I suppose, and being curious, but again, actually it was my, the puraka, it was the mythologies, is where I found so many answers that, that, that my grandmother couldn't tell me, that the books couldn't tell me, and, and I started to, to, you know, but things you also grow, grow grown up with, and, and being in Aotearoa, I, I grew up with the legends of Maui, and, and how he was, you know, a man of a thousand fricks. I also heard on good authority that he had a rather large penis that hung to the left. <laughs> <laughs> that was footnoted, thank you very much, too. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> the things they don't tell you. <laughs> Are the things that really I know. Yeah, but even knowing things like that, and and a lot of those things I found out was actually hanging out with our elder woman, to, um, and and we used to every what was it, every Wednesday, every second Wednesday, the Cook Island mamas, um, the Tuvaluan mamas, Kiribati mamas, and the Pacific sisters would all go hang out in this space, and we would you know, talk and laugh and I would learn things like that <laughs> and more. I was like, oh, I can't hardly wait till I'm older. Oh my goodness, just can you imagine what I could be like then? That was, that was such great inspiration for me. Actually because there, in that world I wasn't being judged within, within a Western mainstream canon. Mm. You know, so without that, you know, see books could never give me that. There's no, you know, it was just like, so that's yeah, so it was going deeper and deeper, and just that curiosity, like Maui, and to question things. No, that's not, that's not good enough. The sun is going far too fast, and it just needs to slow down, because I can't get all my shit done. <laughs> you, know, you know, so then he goes, what, bashes the living shit out of the sun? <laughs> but in the process, he developed a lot of the plating, mm. which we use in our craft base. So for me, when I'm crafting, when I'm plaiting the, the eight plat or the three, for me, that is the space where Maui and I are sharing that same space in the now. And, and so, okay. you know, and that really used to excite me by using heritage. That, that was really a way that I could physically connect with the past and, and that curiosity. And, you know, and the other lesson, of course, was that, you know, if you push it too far, you know, you may find yourself crushed between the thighs <laughs> of a great ancestress. <laughs> you know, so, you know, be care for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so there's all these, yeah, so for me, for me it was the legends. They, they, and that's where I found the woman, that's where I found Nafa Nua, a warrior goddess. You know, that's when I was like, oh my goddess, you know. 
and you know there was big talks about about you know when the, the a lot of the feminist agenda was really big in New Zealand a couple of years ago because they were acknowledging mm. the the women's suffragette movement, which was very beneficial to to Pākehā women and maybe not so beneficial to to the native woman mm. sort of population. So we re, we really were unpacking mana wahini at that time because because. We were, we were really downtrodden. The role of, mm. of Indigenous women had, had kind of sunk to a bit of a low. And I think yeah. like one of the great things that we have is that we're all makers and creators and we have traditional DNA embedded in us. That for us, it feels like it's a natural thing just to be making and creating and being able to share that Got knowledge it. with each other and those skills and learn some new tricks. And for me, I really like looking outside of traditional materials, I, I like looking in dumpsters and um, re looking at things that maybe yeah. you wouldn't traditionally use for making. There's but think, crack in the world. think more about recycling, like I made these big necklaces just using bread tags, it's like things and bottle tops that if you think, we've got these beautiful bottle tops for example, they're red and they've got a tui on it, a black tui. I thought anywhere in the world that could be like a precious a precious button or something, but in New Zealand we just throw it in the rubbish. So, it, and it also tells our story of place of where we are. So I think looking at things differently, mm. and then applying your skills to create something. Yeah, and I think that also picks up on the resourcefulness of our ancestors as well, and that the idea that actually we were, you know, they were always creating. Back when Cook arrived and bought them out blankets. They undid them all and rewound them and put them in the in the kakahu. So you know that that creativity has always been there, and it's about tapping into that and utilising the environment and hopefully u using that wisely. Um, yeah, the techniques, uh, the cult our cultural ways of doing things, the reasoning, the histories behind why why things are happening, the way in which we do things, that really inspires me. Mm. Um, for my work, I was um, looking at a huge topic of death and mourning across the Pacific in, um, in Aotearoa, and you know, I could only choose a few things really to input into that work, but um, I just enjoy seeing the similarities and the very particular differences as well between the islands and um, trying to uncover, it's always a process of trying to uncover what is the reason why. Uh, we were talking about the idea of island time the other day and how it used to get bandied around uh, when we were growing up, you know, particularly of like, oh, you know, island time, as if that's a bad thing. And island time, I realised when we actually went to Samoa and we stayed in my mum's village, I realised when they re respectfully were discussing who had the right to talk on behalf of my village to the group that was brought in, that is an example of island time. You just do what needs to be done in the order that it needs to be done because that is the way of making sure that everything that needs to be done is done and that is island time. And so I didn't need to be shy or embarrassed about that at all. Yeah, mm. thank you. Yes, island time is when the time is right. <laughs> and maybe it's time for one more question. <laughs> okay. Absolutely, yep. You know, your wife and, you know, the mother of your children, um, we all went to battle. And I guess you were conjuring, in my mind, uh, a, a semblance of that energy. Because uh, Polynesian women, and by the way, I, I brought back the exhibit in 2005 from Germany of Cook's first expedition. Oh, so I was the only woman mm. that went to Germany and brought them back. And I had a very powerful experience doing that. But because you're a Polynesian woman, and because when the white men came, they displaced the men of their roles. Mm. They weren't the providers anymore. You know, they were again. Then there was another religion placed on everybody else. So with all of this behind you, okay, what 
individual direction you would you would tell a young woman to do, a middle-aged woman to do, a kapuna to do. How could you say this to them? You know, with the mana that is inside of you, to tell a generation. No, no biggie or anything. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it, it's, it's a big mantle because, you know, I think for us, we just kind of, you know, we had to start just with ourselves, just to uplift ourselves to be able to even get to a point where we could hope that, that others could, could sort of relate or do. Mm. And, and that's why we really cl kind of clung together too because we were, we were pretty neat, neat back then. You know, because they weren't quite ready. You know, a lot of a lot of our our mainstream culture wasn't wasn't ready for powerful mm. mana wahine. You know, new and Aotearoa is is a feisty feisty place. You know, and and I and I, and it's just as you said, the women were there by their men, and I think I think that's some of the lessons that that we learnt too, because you can't do it by yourself. You know, we did need our men. We did need our babies. We really did need that village mm. to to do that. And I suppose we were kind of re recreating our own little village inside this urban sort of yeah. landscape. So do you, do you, when you work with this generation, invoke the cultural gods into the conversations? When we have our own meetings, we do we do have protocols that. That, that we follow. So we do when we gather, we do say karakia, we do, you know, we make, we open spaces, we close spaces, you know, we, we, we do, there's, for my particular piece, I didn't eat um, for the night before, so that, you know, that because I knew that I was sort of entering a particular realm, and, and I just, Sort of hope, and I, you know, and I have passed this down to my son, which is mm. why it was a pleasure to have him just naturally be there at, at our side. It wasn't something we kind of had to kind of twist his arm at, and he was there. And a lot of times he does karakia now, mm. and so it's you know, it, you these know. are these are roles that we've grown into as well that we've mm. become comfortable. You know, we were, yeah. weren't always this comfortable That's right. with ourselves it's and our journey. being yeah. put into these positions, but. As I said, we can make more change on the inside. So now we have an opportunity to create platforms for those new ones that are coming through and to support them and to mentor them. So we do have that opportunity to show and share and nurture. I hope that helps. Yeah, we do mentor. And mentoring is a really important value that we take. With, with a lot of our, you know, if there's any young person, usually they are wahine, will come knocking on my studio door. The door is always open for them. They can sit with me, we talk, and some of them stay around and some of them move, mm. move, move away, but there's been, there's quite a few that are now have their own art mm -hmm. sort of trajectories in it's, and it's, and it gives, it does, it gives me an absolute thrill just just it's good for us too. Sometimes we yeah. go find them and they give us a lift. Oh, they totally. give us a boost. Yeah. You know, we're like, oh, I'm so tired. And then it's like, oh, my God, look what they're doing. Oh, that's so exciting. Yeah. I want to <laughs> help or do something too. So we need that too. We need that uplifting. It's tato, tato. Yeah. Yes, I think that's the key too is that we're actually trying to help. By helping others, we help ourselves. And um, providing opportunities where we know that certain groups can work with other groups. Um, you know, we, we have more experience now to be able to just try and make that happen or understand that that might be, you know, an appropriate thing. And those are the opportunities that we look to create. Mm.
still this mana um, to many circles. Um, your inner circle, your outer circle. Yeah. I don't I don't know why I'm saying this that I, I feel you have that um, capacity. Um, and if you're spreading out in the wider Pacific, um, that is incredible because the dialogue between Tongans and Samoa and the Hawaiians and you know the Pacific Islanders, the Polynesians, you know, is so important yeah. mm. in order for us to collectively overcome, you know, white supremacy, mm. you know, colonization and all of that. And I just feel very strongly through your art that I'm looking at that you guys are accomplishing this in, in small and big steps and large steps. No, I think that's why the Triennale is, is because, you know, it's its third rendition. And I, I've, you know, and it, it can go in many different directions. And it was really satisfying to see that Josh is now sort of at the table, so to speak. Josh, no pressure, no pressure, baby. <laughs> but yeah, and, you know, and just to ensure that we've got a voice around the table and that's where a lot of it's a lot of it starts when mm. I first met Josh was yeah a little whooper snipper so it was just like but <laughs> when was it I okay? kind yeah no, I think it was I mean I did this exercise of like yeah. retracing all of the steps so like I, I think I f we first crossed paths in 2017 when you came out for the triennial or for the first Honolulu Biennial yeah. participating as a collaborator in Lisa Rehana's film and then it was working together um, with Savage Club for 2019 um, with Nina, um, and then Aikai, and then I think, now yeah, I think Aikai mm, was so really before Aikai was in 2017 because I was yeah, yeah, coming yeah, that's yeah. Right. and I always love these beautiful relationships. It's with the relationship that mm. you know. Always, that's where our love story obviously started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And the sisters have been involved in every iteration so far, so let's see what we'll, happens. We'll be out next year, don't worry, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm sure there's plenty of Pacific sisters yeah. in Hawaii. So it's, mm. and you're right, so important that the, you know, that that we that we are enabled to talk with 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 each other in these opportunities. And you know, I'm sure, like in Aotearoa, we feel so far away sometimes. And I'm sure Hawaii feels like that sometimes, but when we have these gatherings, just all this beautiful just sort of bubbling of, yeah, of mana, of, of mana mm. is enabled. So long may it rain, and mm. yeah, and hopefully you can work hard around that table because I'm sure that, you know, most, like even the APT was the other big Asia Pacific Triennale is yeah. another, mm. you know, and it still relies heavily on on the people that come from the furthest away, and sometimes it's just so nice when we, we really have a space where we can don't have to explain yeah. anything or put a context in. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. oh, mahalo. I think that's a great a great um, space to end it in. So I just want to mahalo each of you. Mahalo to the sisters. The sisters, wherever you are, <laughs> mahalo. Uh, mahalo to you, Fiona, Suzanne, Rosanna, and Lily. Um, and thank you to everyone who's joining us, who's joined us today. Um, stay tuned for the next Art in Conversation, which will be happening next Super Saturday in September. So, um, mahalo nui, loa yeah, kakoa pao.
Thank you.